Hello everyone, welcome to People's Question Time Online. If you wish to tweet about the event tonight, the hashtag is PQT. We have five core topic areas and we'll spend up to 19 minutes on each. Other questions relating to the Mayor and Assembly's remit outside of these core topics can be asked in the final section. This is how it works. For each topic, the chair will take approximately five questions. Two of these will be live video questions taken from members of the public who submitted questions whilst registering through our London.gov website. One additional question, or more if we have time, will be taken from the most liked questions posted by registered audience members from our live chat forum. The chair will direct these to the mayor or an assembly member. Now, to make sure we get through as many questions as possible and cover a range of issues, duplicated questions will not be asked. Please keep your questions short and on topic and refrain from abusive or defamatory remarks. These will not be posted. With so many of you online, we won't be able to ask everyone's question. After the event, though, registered audience members will receive a feedback form with details of how to submit questions to the Mayor and London Assembly. We'll finish tonight at 9pm sharp. This event is being broadcast live and recorded. For those with hearing impairments, there will be live subtitles throughout the event, as well as a British Sign Language interpreter, who should be visible to you in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. For anyone wishing to have a transcript of the event, this will be available on request after the event. And now, I'd like to introduce your chair this evening, London-wide Assembly member and chair of the London Assembly, Andrew Boff. Good evening and welcome to People's Question Time Online. The Mayor and the London Assembly work to improve life for Londoners and make our city a great place to live and work. That's why we want to hear from you about things that need to be improved. Tonight is your chance to voice concerns and ask the Mayor and Assembly members what we are doing for the capital and its people. Welcome, to, please, to uh, your London Assembly members who are joining us virtually tonight. And finally, please welcome the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Before we begin with your questions, I wanted to share a few thoughts with you in my role as chair of the London Assembly. The London Assembly is the voice of London, composed of 25 members elected at the same time as the mayor in order to hold him to account and scrutinize his policies. With that in mind, we've been very busy in recent months on your behalf. The London Assembly Health Committee, uh, for example, held a meeting to explore the healthcare experience for trans and, trans and gender diverse people. Our Fire and Resilience Emergency Planning Committee called for the Waking Watch Relief Fund to be extended to residents in buildings under 18 metres. The Police and Crime Committee questioned the Metropolitan Police Commissioner Cressida Dick on her response to the findings of, of the inquests into the four men killed by Stephen Port and what action the force is taking to improve trust in London's LGBTQ plus community. The Health Committee was regularly updated on the progress of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 and it also investigated the impact uh, of the pandemic on waiting times for elective and outpatient treatment and the implications of this for Londoners' health. The Transport Committee wrote to the Chief Executive of Crossrail asking if Omicron would delay the launch of the new Elizabeth Line. The Met Police Commissioner announced to the Police and Crime Committee that the Met would be investigating a number of events that took place at Downing Street and Whitehall in the last two years. The Economy Committee published Night Vision, its report into rebuilding London's nighttime economy. We reviewed London's 2021 elections and made suggestions for the 2024 polls. Last week, we made two amendments to the Mayor's draft budget, one to introduce a building safety support hub 
and another to introduce a resident empowerment reserve fund. And the Environment Committee is currently investigating the impact of air pollution in London, particularly on children, and assessing the Mayor's current and future plans for tackling it. Now, you can keep up with our work by following us on Twitter at London, uh, at London Assembly and watching our meetings on YouTube. So thank you once again for joining us tonight online, and I very much look forward to answering your questions this evening. I now invite uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to give an opening address. Mr Mayor. Well, th thank you, uh, Andrew. Thank you, everyone, the Londoners who've joined this People's uh, Question Time. I know there's lots happening in the news with various resignations from Downing Street today. There may be more over the course of the next couple of hours, so thank you for joining us uh, rather than being distracted by resignations uh, this evening. There's no doubt it's been a tough couple of years. The pandemic has claimed the lives of thousands of uh, Londoners, as well as doing huge damage to our businesses, our communities and people's mental health. But now Plan B restrictions that have been lifted, I truly believe we can look forward with hope and optimism because our underlying strengths in London remain intact our creativity and compassion, our energy and openness, and our incredible dynamism and diversity. And it's by drawing on these assets that I'm confident we can put the dark days of the pandemic behind us and build a better and brighter future for London's communities. Since I was first elected in 2016, City Hall has made huge strides to improve Londoners' quality of life. We've delivered ambitious programmes to clean up our air and bring down emissions. We've delivered record numbers of genuinely affordable homes. We've delivered a five-year freeze on TfL fares, as well as the Hopper bus fare, which together have made public transport more affordable for millions of Londoners. We've delivered skills training, to more than 400,000 adult Londoners to help equip them with the tools and the qualifications they need to get on. We've delivered important support to EU citizens, helping to protect their rights post-Brexit. We've delivered a significant increase in police numbers, helping to reverse the huge government cuts with more than a thousand extra officers on London's streets. And we've delivered record investment in youth services with tens of millions of pounds put into creating positive opportunities for young Londoners. This is a record of progress and delivery. And it's one I'm incredibly proud of. But I'm acutely aware that there are still so much more to do to overcome the challenges we face and to ensure our city's recovery works for all, regardless of where you live or your background. The pandemic, the cost of living crisis, and the government's anti-London attitude are undoubtedly making this work harder. But as mayor, I've always focused on the practical steps we can take to improve people's lives. That's why we'll continue our approach of being tough on crime, and tough on the causes of crime, which is starting to yield real results. That's why we'll continue to prioritize those areas where we can make a meaningful and lasting difference, like helping homeless Londoners off our streets. And that's why I'll continue to bang the drum for London to attract the jobs, business, and investment our city needs to grow and flourish. After the struggles, of the last two years, I'm determined to help get our city back on its feet and thriving again. I was proud this week to announce a major expansion of our adult skills program with an offer of free training for any Londoner aged 19 or over who is unemployed on a low income or has limited formal education. This initiative, which will boost business and aid our economy is just one example of the concrete action we're taking 
to help Londoners with the cost of living, support our recovery and tackle the inequalities and injustices that COVID-19 has so starkly exposed in our city. It's also fundamental to achieving my personal ambition of creating a city where everyone gets the helping hand they need to fulfill their potential. Andrew Chair, colleagues, let me end by saying this. Together, I firmly believe we can ensure that London is an even better place to live and work after the pandemic than it was before. That it's fairer, safer, greener and more prosperous. It won't be easy, but this is the goal we must set ourselves as a city, if for no other reason than because it's how we'll do right by all those Londoners who've suffered and sacrificed so much over the last two years. It's to them we owe it to continue our work and to continue our progress to build a better London. I look forward to taking your questions during the course of the next two hours. Thank you, Mr Mayor. We will now begin taking questions in the following order. Transport, policing and safety, air quality and the environment, housing, London's economic recovery, and finally, anything else not covered, for example, education and culture. Questions about COVID-19 will be taken throughout the uh, event in whichever section they best fit. For each topic, we will take two live questions followed by a few questions from the live chat, available to the, all of those who have pre-registered. Over 600 questions were received before the event. Please note that the chat is for questions only. Comments will not be published. Questions for each topic will be published at the start of the relevant section. And we will not be able to answer all of your questions tonight. So please remember to keep your questions short. <coughs> I will also be asking the mayor and members to keep their answers short and to the point so we can fit in as many questions as we can. Most importantly, you can, like other people's, uh, other people's questions, um, and those that have the most likes will be asked first, assuming that they are on topic and have not already been asked. It's now time to hear from you, so please do start submitting your questions in the chat. Our first topic tonight is transport. Uh, make, sure you start, uh, make sure you start to add and like questions on this topic now. And I'd like to now welcome our first questioner from a uh, question, and it's from Jill Barber from the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, who will ask our first question. Jill. Thank you. As a disabled person who's unable to cycle or walk distances, I do feel marginalised by the constant policies against car drivers in London. Driving for a lot of disabled people makes us feel equal and, dare I say, normal. This seems to be undermined by these policies. What assurances can you give that we will be treated as equals? Thank you. Thank you, for that, Jill, for that question and for starting us off tonight. Um, and we're just going to take one other question now from Javier D'Souza from Harrow, who will ask uh, a second question on transport. Javier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think London has the world's best transport system, but I worry that in the wake of the pandemic that services will suffer and fares will skyrocket, making transport less affordable and accessible for all Londoners. How does the Mayor plan to keep the books balanced, but not at a cost to Londoners? Thanks, Abby. Uh, can I ask the Mayor to respond, if he may? Thank you, Jill and Javier, both of your questions. Jill, let me do with your question first. Look, we're a city of 10 million uh, Londoners. We're basically a Roman town that's expanded over the last uh, 2000 uh, years. What we can't afford to have is one health crisis, COVID, replaced by another one because everyone jumps back in their car, uh, which will lead to a health crisis caused by toxic air. I want to free up our roads for people like you, uh, commercial drivers like plumbers, electricians, like black taxis, uh, so you can use the roads when you need to do so. And so those that can make the transition, to walk in and cycling or public transport or to cleaner forms of uh, driving should uh, uh, do so. But what nobody wants, not least you, Jill, 
because you rely upon your car as a disabled Londoner, is to be stuck in gridlock. The cost of congestion is uh, uh, the average Londoner who uses their car regularly being stuck in their, stuck in their car every year for 150 hours. Uh, that's more than six days. It costs our economy more than £5.1 billion, but also uh, has a problem for our air and also greenhouse gas emissions. If we're going to get to zero carbon by 2030, we've got to reduce uh, car journeys by around a quarter, not for people like you who need to use their cars, but for others who can walk, cycle and use public transport. And that's why we're building more cycle lanes across uh, our city, a five-fold increase since I've been mayor. We're widening our pavements. So I, for the first five years as I was mayor, I froze our fares and introduced the Hopper Fair to make it more attractive for people who can make that transition to uh, uh, do so. Have in relation to your, your questions in uh, uh, Harrow, listen, in the first five years I was mayor, before the pandemic, I was the mayor who reduced uh, TfL's deficit by more than a billion pounds, more than 71%, because I understand the importance of uh, the value for uh, money. I increased our cash balances by more than 13%, so it was 2.1 billion pounds before the pandemic began. The only reason, the only reason TfL has financial challenges is because of the pandemic. Londoners did the right thing. They stayed at home. And so few people use public transport. Our fares income dried up. And so we needed support from the government. The problem at Javier is, is the government have attached loads of conditions on this funding that we need. One of them is to take away free travel for those below the age of 18. Another one was to take away free travel for those above the age of uh, 60. Another one was to increase the congestion charge uh, that Jill knows about seven days a week to 15 pounds up until 10 p.m. And there are other conditions they've uh, attached. What we're saying to the government is on the one hand, you're saying you want to give other parts of the country a London-style transport authority, but London itself very soon won't have a London-style uh, transport system. And so I agree with you completely about the importance of um, us having a good world-class transport authority. The bad news is our current funding deal with the government runs out this Friday. Unless the government gives us a long-term funding deal, including for capital expenditure, we will have no choice but to have a decline in public transport in uh, London. And that could mean almost 20% uh, uh, cut in buses, almost 10% cut in tubes. And many of the cycle uh, lanes, many of the junctions we're gonna make safer not being able to be done. So any help you can give to lobby the government for a decent deal for our capital city, not only would I appreciate, but so will Londoners across our great city. Thank you. Can I ask Assembly Member Berry, uh, Sean Berry, to respond? Thank you so much, and thank you for both of those questions. Um, I think it's, it's, the Mayor is right. The government has treated Londoners appallingly in this whole situation with the deal. It's ridiculous that we know we today don't have a deal for funding transport in London that lasts beyond tomorrow. We need long term funding settlements so that we can plan ahead. We need to be seeing improvements in public transport and, and fair cuts, not not the people taking away the fair um free buses and the free travel that people already have. In Scotland, the Greens in government have just delivered additional free buses to everybody under 22. That's the kind of vision we need to be able to plan for in London. But at the moment, we can't. And the government's now taking money away also from the national rail operators. So what we've got is a situation where Buses are being cut by Transport for London by about 20%. We're seeing some rail operators around London cutting their timetables by about 50%, half the frequency on some of the services. And what this is doing is creating car dependency, forced car ownership. So this is people like Jill who have to own a car for dis disability reasons, but also many, many other people. I asked Londoners this week whether or not they were car dependent, whether they were forced to own a car. And in outer London, it's a quarter of people. This isn't right and it's going in the wrong direction. And the government needs to step up and fund London so that we can have a transport system we can be proud of where people have cheap and affordable and frequent transport services to where they need to get to go because they can't be forced into cars. That's absolutely no good in a modern city. Uh, Assembly member uh, Nick Rogers, would you like to come in? Thank you. Just briefly, um, to Jill from Hammersmith and Fulham, 
uh, my colleagues um, on the uh, Conservative group, um, we've recognised that uh, a lot of disabled people are reliant on cars to uh, have a, a decent quality of life and to move around the city. So um, we proposed a motion in the Assembly calling for uh, an exemption uh, from the ULES charge for blue badge holders. And I'd, I'd like to thank the Green Group for supporting uh, that motion. Unfortunately, Labour and Lib Dems uh, did not support the motion. Uh, I think um, with something like the ULES charge, it's important that we, we recognise that different communities in London have different needs, and we have to be very careful about um, policies that even inadvertently uh, exclude people. Um, and I think that um, a blue badge exemption is still a very good idea, um, and uh, I, would, I would still very much support that. Thank you. Um, and now Assemblymember Prince, uh, and if you can be nice and brief, Assemblymember Prince, because there's a few questions now coming in on the chat. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to uh, give clarity to why we find ourselves in this mess in relation to funding. Uh, the government have always made it clear that they're quite happy to pay the cost of COVID, but not prepared to co pay the cost of Khan. And in the negotiations that uh, the mayor has been trying to have with the government, on two occasions, he has left it to the very last day before pro providing the really necessary information that the government need in order to make these negotiations work. So he really needs to raise his game and work with the government and not against them. Thank you. I'm now going to move uh, to questions that are on the chat. And the first question, I'm going to read through three of these questions and then invite <coughs> the Mayor to respond and Assembly members. Um, a question to the Mayor of London. When will you lift the travel limit for the over 60s Oyster card holders and the Freedom Pass holders, enabling them to travel during peak, uh, peak periods, particularly in the morning? Uh, and some of us continue to work, says Mrs. Uh, Saida Rajbali Davis from Brent. And we've got um, a, a question from uh, Mark Anthony Bastiani in Wandsworth. Will, t the TfL, will TfL increase the number of underground stations that have step-free access? Can't see that next question. And um, something about killing the West End of economy. Let's, let's go with those two questions. There's one more in the pipeline. Uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you for those uh, uh, questions. Um, so the first question is bad news for Mrs. Saida Rajpali uh, Davis. The bad news is, I'm afraid, um, I, I can't um, say uh, if I'll be able to uh, reinstall uh, free travel for those above the age of 60 before 9 a.m. The good news is uh, Keith Prince, who is the, uh, the, the, the chap who spoke before Andrew, uh, you can tell from what he was reading, uh, he's a Conservative uh, member. Uh, his party want me to remove altogether free travel whatever time of day for those above the age of 60 and children. So I've said to those Conservatives, both the ones on this assembly who will read out stuff being party political and those Conservatives in government, I'm not willing to take away your free travel because I know it's a freedom pass for you. You may be stuck at home otherwise, uh, if you didn't have the Freedom Pass or be able to do the work you do. So the good news is I can keep that Freedom Pass for you. The bad news is the government's quite clear. When I met Grant Shapps in 2020, he's the Secretary of State for uh, Transport. He's the chap doing the Excel spreadsheet to keep the Prime Minister in his job. He said I had to take away free travel for older people before 9am. And I'm afraid I, I don't think I can bring it back before 9am. Uh, that's the bad news, I'm afraid. But there is good news that as long as I'm there, you'll have uh, free travel other than during the morning uh, rush hour. Uh, for Mark Bastiani, so let me tell you where we are. When I first became mayor, so we've got underground stations, we have TfL rail stations, we have overground stations, we've got the Elizabeth line, and we have our buses. Uh, so the amount of underground stations that were step free was about a quarter when I became at mayor. I've increased that to around a third, and we have plans to do far more step free on the underground but again, because the government, and by the way, Sean Berry was absolutely right. And that's a good example of the Green Party and myself working closely together. Of course, we have political differences. Of course, we do. 
But that's a constructive uh, example of us working together. And Sean is spot on, by the way, about the importance of investment in our capital city. We contribute hugely to uh, our national economy, and so we should. We've got to invest in public transport in a city of 10 million. Because the government uh, hasn't told me how much money we're going to get after Friday, I can't invest in more step-free access stations on the underground. We've paused the ones that didn't go above a certain stage. We're going to carry on with the ones we started, like, like in Harrow. On TFL Rail, uh, we have record numbers of those who are step-free. Every single station on the Elizabeth line uh, will be step-free, 40 stations in total, and all 9,000-plus of our buses are step-free. Uh, but like Sean, I desperately want the government to do right by our capital city, not treat our city uh, as a political football and punish us uh, for things outside our control. Thank you. Could I ask Assemblymember Hirani to come in at that point? Thanks. Just adding to what the Mayor said, um, I think it's just endless in all of this. So when you look at how the government have treated some of the private rail companies uh, across the country, they've been given debt-free uh, and condition-free uh, bailout deals. But London, for some reason, just seems to be treated differently. And going back to, I think, um, even Javier in, in the uh, first round of questioning, talking about some of the investment in public transport, uh, we've had great public transport investment in, in Harrow. Uh, we've, we've seen the new electric buses on the H9 and H10 routes, uh, extension of the 324 bus, uh, tube station investment. Uh, so Sudbury Hill is now step free and uh, Harrow on the Hill soon to be completed a step free as well. Investment in the Piccadilly line fleets coming forward as well. But all of that is under threat because of what we're seeing from the current government, how they are treating London differently. Uh, if they were treating other parts of uh, the transport network across the country the same, I think we could we could understand. But the injustice in this is uh, what why London is being treated differently. And I think as uh, a Labour Assembly group, along with the mayor, uh, we're standing up for London uh, to make sure that that case is made. Thank you. And now Assembly Member Caroline Pigeon, who chairs the Transport Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really interesting, this discussion. Um, I'm a Liberal Democrat, and Liberal Democrats believe in devolution, making sure decisions are made at the right level. And that means if we've devolved transport and other services to the Mayor of London, it should be for the Mayor of London to have the resources and to be able to decide how to spend that money according to what he or she has been elected on. And what we've seen since um, the start of the pandemic is the government trying to interfere in what is rightly London's decision. And whilst it's fine for the government to help with some finance, I don't think it's right for the government to be dictating to us what should happen in London, what services should be provided. And the model is clearly broken. You could not rely on 75% of your income coming from fares and tell people not to travel and expect it not to work. So I think it's really important that the government should put money into our transport system. Every other world city has public money going in. I think it's really important because otherwise, going forward, we are going to see serious cuts to our bus services. No more step-free or other accessibility works, whether that's tactile paving at our rail network in London or whether it's other accessibility measures. London absolutely deserves a first-class transport system that's accessible, it's modern, it's green and affordable. And that is something the Liberal Democrats will keep fighting both with the government to get the funding we need, but also pushing this mayor to do more. Thank you. Um, there is uh, there's one last question in this section. We've got about a minute uh, before we have to move on. But the question is from Harvinda Verdi from uh, Redbridge. Uh, uh, and I think it's to the mayor, are you not killing the West End economy by extending the charging to 10 p.m.? Not everyone can use public transport that they want to late at night. Um, ultra, ultra low emission zone is another business killer, don't you think? Mr. Mayor, if you could answer very briefly. I think I've got some really good news for you, which is rather the government what it means to make it permanent seven days a week till 10 o'clock from in three weeks time, uh, the congestion charge will be reduced from 10 p.m. to 6 p.m., supporting the nighttime economy, supporting our businesses. And at the weekend, it will be from 12 to 6. It's possible to be pro the environment, pro cleaning up uh, our air, pro cutting congestion and, and being pro business. 
Thank you. Uh, I regret to say that we are now to, out of time on the transport questions. If we didn't get to answer your specific question, uh, the online feedback form, which will be emailed to the registered audience members, will explain how to submit your questions and get a reply after the event. So our next topic is policing and safety, which includes any questions about uh, community safety, policing and the London Fire Brigade. Don't forget to like the questions in the chat that you most want us to answer. Uh, I'd like to, for, this, uh, for the first question in this section, to welcome, uh, ask Naomi Blake from the London Borough of Wandsworth to answer, ask her questions. A question. Hello. Yeah. Hello, good evening. Um, there has been a rise since the COVID first lockdown of domestic abuse and the high rates of murders related to this domestic abuse. Um, I would like to ask um, what would be what would um, the mayor be doing in supporting victims of domestic abuse? Thank you, Naomi. And the next question online is uh, from Bushra Ahmed from Croydon. Thank you. Um, my question is, what is the mayor doing to address the important issues around Islamophobia and hate crime in London, not only through the Met Police, but also through other agencies? Thank you, Bushra. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, could you answer those two questions? Thank, thanks, uh, Andrew. Uh, Naomi, thanks for your question. I mean, you may not know this, but I live in Wandsworth as well, uh, uh, where you live. Um, we were concerned back uh, in March, when the, actually before March 2020, when the pandemic uh, uh, led to a lockdown, about the consequences, particularly on women, who are at the receiving of, receiving of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And the reason we were concerned is because we saw what's happening in China and in Italy, which were ahead of us when it came to the pandemic and lockdown. You will know, Naomi, that unfortunately many uh, women and girls who suffer domestic abuse, domestic violence, often uh, are, are at the hands of somebody in the home. Uh, and the concern was if they were in lockdown, they'd be in the home with the abuser and not be able to flee. Because if they fled, they would maybe break in the lockdown rules and would get into uh, trouble. So what we did was uh, we, from City Hall, in year, changed our budget to give money to uh, uh, survivor groups and and uh, uh, and victim groups to help them get accommodation, to help women and their children flee in uh, persecution, abuse at the hand of uh, the men inside the home. But the Met Police Service also increased uh, the amount of police officers doing this work. The Met Police Service set up uh, uh, predatory offender units across London and took out the abusers, arrest, charge and prosecuted record numbers of uh, abusers. The other thing, uh, Naomi, you know, at Christmas time, uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence goes up as well. And this Christmas as well, uh, we did lots of work to try and support victims and survivors, particularly those uh, uh, women of colour who often don't go to the police or, or their GP, and there needs to be specialist groups to help them out uh, as well. I'm particularly worried, Naomi, about asylum seekers, those who have no recourse to public funds, who are worried if they go to the police, they may be deported. And that's why we work with survivor groups who have got credibility um, and have confidence for women to uh, come forward. The final thing in relation to that question you asked at Naomi is, uh, we've got to make sure uh, that no woman suffers in silence. Uh, and that's why we've got a number of campaigns on, on the public transport network uh, in local communities to encourage women to come forward. And that includes training our police to be more civic and sensitive to uh, what survivors and victims say. It's made really difficult though, when a survivor's waiting two years for the incident or incidents to lead to a trial. And so we're also encouraging the government to deal with the backlog of cases in relation to domestic abuse, domestic uh, violence. Bushra, thank you for your, your, your question uh, uh, as well. Since I've been there, uh, there's been a coalition of the assembly. I think all of the assembly, this is one of the few issues we all agree on. I've tried to make London uh, a, a zero tolerance place for hate crime, and that includes Islamophobia. Whether you're a Conservative, Labour, Green, uh, or Lib Dem, they also have supported my policies, a really good example of making sure everyone understands that nobody should suffer in silence, you must report hate crime. Even if you think it's trivial, report it. Uh, uh, we've worked with uh, community groups who've got credibility in different communities, in Muslim communities, Jewish communities, 
uh, the LGBTQ plus community uh, and others, for them to uh, act as third party groups who can come forward and report uh, allegations of Islamophobia or other forms of racism. And then the police have taken action where there is evidence. And that also means, Bushra, we've had teams look at what happens in social media. You will know the distress and harm and upset it causes uh, people who are different, the other, even when the hatred is in social media, a crime is a crime. And so that's led to more people reporting it, uh, more action being taken. I'm afraid the amount of uh, prosecutions, uh, uh, charges is still not where it should be. And that's why we're encouraging people to uh, come forward, encouraging people to uh, report these things, but also encouraging more of our police service to look like our communities so they come forward and uh, report crimes. We do know, for example, Bushra, when President Trump was saying certain things, Islamophobia went up. We do know, for example, that when certain things happen in the Middle East, uh, anti-Semitism uh, goes up. Uh, so there's a link between things happening elsewhere around the world and hate crime. Uh, and one of the great things that the Assembly have done with me, and I'm really grateful, is building up coalitions. So one community who's a minority working with another community that's a minority, and that sort of social capital. And that's one of the things I'm really proud of this Assembly. Uh, I think we may have differences in, in some of our policies. On this issue, though, we are united. Thank you. Could, could I ask uh, Assembly Member Umesh Desai to uh, answer? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be brief because this is people's question time and we, of course, want more questions from the public. But look, can I just make uh, three points about violence against women and girls um, and what work the Assembly has done in addition to the work that the Mayor is, is already uh, has done and is doing. Uh, we got a position in support of recognizing misogyny as a hate crime. Uh, the House of Lords, in the form of the Newland Amendment, actually uh, has got that position and it's a shame that uh, the government has, did a U-turn following the Prime Minister's announcement uh, uh, last year, that in, they were in support of recognizing misogyny as a hate crime, and then uh, an abrupt U-turn. Uh, so, you know, I urge Londoners to continue to lobby your MP to support moves in the Commons to get uh, misogyny recognized uh, as a hate crime. The other thing that the Assembly has been doing uh, has been consistently lobbying for a domestic abusers register, um, and this, I think, is so, so important. Uh, it's been a long-standing campaign of the Assembly, supported by all parties, I may add. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the mayor is in the process of finalizing his uh, police and crime plan. Again, the Assembly Police Committee has discussed this at some length, will be submitting a response to the mayor. But this is London's chance because this has, the crime plan sets out the mayor's priorities over the next four years. So get in touch with the GLA to give your views on what the mayor can be doing. And very finally, Andrew, hate crime just like domestic violence, it's about education. Uh, and some of, well, the assembly, uh, I, I was chair uh, uh, up to last year, but three years ago, we did a major review uh, into hate crime, uh, many suggestions. Uh, it's all available on the website. Hate crime is, remains uh, high on the uh, police committee's uh, agenda. And uh, I think it's through campaigning. So just last week with colleagues at Lords, I don't know if it's a campaign the mayor supports, we launched a campaign called Bowl Out Racism. Assembly member Krupa Shirani was there as well. And hopefully this will be a major national campaign starting from London uh, to actually tackle the issues of racism, identify the, by the inquiry into racism in Yorkshire cricket. Thank you. Let's um, move on now to the top liked questions from the chat. There's three of these. I'll ask, I'll ask them all in one go and then if Assembly members and the Mayor could, uh, could answer. First question comes from Dinesh Sati from Lewisham. In the wake of the horrific, disturbing and appalling police culture at Charing Cross Police Station, how can Londoners feel safe approaching the police I would be concerned to approach them. Is it time for Cressida Dick to go? Second question comes from Innie in Enfield. With the, raise, the rise in uh, knife crime in our cities, what help can be given to grassroots communities like local churches to tackle this problem? And the final question is from Pretty in Sutton. Can Mr. Sadiq Khan please provide assurance that you are taking actions to reduce knife crime? If I can go to the mayor to answer those questions, please. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Can I thank all three of those uh, Londoners for their excellent uh, questions? Look, um, 
Dean, I think it's possible to, on the one hand, recognise the huge progress the police have made over the last 20 years, uh, uh, you know, in being a better police force, in understanding the concerns of minority communities uh, and what they had 20 years ago, but also to say there are big problems in our police service in London. Why do I say that? Because anybody who read the uh, Independent Office for Police Conduct's report read some of the things uh, that up to 14 police officers were saying, uh, and what's clear from what they were saying is that they had they hold views that were, are racist, misogynistic, sexist, homophobic, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, but having those number of officers holding those views should make all of us who are decent people both angry and disgusted as it made me. Uh, I've been quite clear to the commissioner She's got to do two really important things in short time. One is to show me and Londoners that she will root out culture that allows this sort, of, this sort of racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, discrimination, and so forth to exist. And two, uh, effective plans to win back the trust and confidence that has been shattered and your question illustrates my point. Uh, and let's wait and see, uh, uh, I'm talking about days and weeks rather than months, what the commissioner uh, comes up with. That being said, uh, I also say we have some of the finest police officers in the world. Uh, uh, police officer Matt Ratty in Croydon lost his life uh, um, serving the community. Keith Palmer lost his life serving his community. So I don't in any way take away from the fantastic work many of our police officers do they are as disgusted as you and I am about what we've seen in this IOPC report. Uh, it is crucial when you police by consent, the public has trust and confidence in the police service to come forward when they're a victim of crime, when they're a witness, or to join the uh, police service. That is really, really important. Idi, and uh, the third question, thank you for your questions in relation to uh, knife crimes. So let me begin uh, by saying I recognize there could be people watching uh, people's question time who may themselves have suffered a knife crime injury or someone in their family has. It is traumatic, uh, both when I was a member of parliament uh, and as mayor, I, met, I meet regularly by the victims of knife crime and uh, bereaved uh, families. Uh, and it makes me want to redouble my efforts to take action to reduce this. So we in London set up England's first violence reduction unit. And let me be frank, it's an idea I copied from Glasgow. Glasgow over a course of a number of years reduced violent crime by having a public health approach when it came to dealing with violent crime like you would a public health issue. Treat the infection, stop it spreading, stop an infection occurring in the first place. And here's the good news. Because of our investment from City Hall, uh, and it feels like I've had one hand tied by my back because of government cuts with our police and everything. But because of the country's first VRU, because of the Young Londoners Fund, we're funding church groups like the one you talk about to do work in the community. Uh, again, apologies to, for mentioning Sean Berry again, but Sean, when I first became mayor, uh, a good example of holding me to account, right? Pushing me, and Sean, forgive me for mentioning you again, but in my first year as mayor, Sean and I and the Labour, the Labour group was, uh, were frustrated by uh, uh, examples of youth clubs closing down. Sean did a report in 2016, forgive me if I get the year wrong, and she quantified the number of youth clubs closed down since 2010. I can't remember the number. Um, and we need to do something to try and fill this massive hole. And so as a consequence of our funding, we uh, now have 86,000 young people benefiting from the Young Women's Fund, 110,000 young people benefiting from um, uh, VIU through church groups and youth centres. And here's the really good news. Uh, uh, homicides down uh, compared to the peak in April 2018 by 20%. Knife crime down by uh, more than 33% since the peak in 2017. Gun crime down by 49%. Uh, Knife crime injury below the age of 25 done by 27%. And I could go on. However, there is uh, something I want to talk about, which is teenage homicides. Last year, there were 30 teenage homicides. Although few people are being stabbed, a few people are going to A&E, the consequences when there is a stabbing are far more serious. And that's why we've got to carry on investing in young people, in youth workers, in mentoring, in using a public health approach. But we can be confident 
our approach is paying dividends. Thank you. Can I ask Assembly Member uh, Caroline Russell to contribute? Uh, can I remind you that we've only got about three minutes left on this section, so if your responses can be very brief. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start by responding to uh, Dinesh's question um, about the IOPC report and the frankly disgusting revelations that we've heard this week about what was going on in the um, in these police WhatsApp groups. I mean, so disgraceful things that just cannot be repeated on a on a broadcast. Um, it's getting to the point where this isn't about individual officers letting down the Met. It's about the Met letting down Londoners as a whole. And it's, you know, London is a proudly diverse, welcoming, socially progressive, and above all, respectful city. And these actions by these police officers just do not represent our city properly. Now, what's worrying is that this is a torrent of revelations. This is part of a whole picture of things that have been coming out. And it is really hard to see how we can, um, how, how the leadership of the Metropolitan Police um, has allowed this culture to continue. It feels as if there has been a blind eye um, applied to it. And we really need the commissioner to be thinking about her position as the um, as the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. It's not OK that um, these people who are meant to be keeping us safe in our city are displaying racism, sexism, misogyny, being rude about disabled people. It's absolutely not OK. And then just finally, on the question of knife crime and knife violence, um, the Assembly has recently agreed a motion which is saying that we believe that the police should not be sharing images of knives, um, of dangerous knives, because it's counterproductive. It frightens young people into carrying knives and can do. And we think the Metropolitan Police should stop sharing these images of dangerous knives. Uh, thank you. When I said there was three minutes, that wasn't a target to hit. Um, can we move on to Assemblymember Bailey? Um, Very thank, quickly, please, thank you, Chair. J just to be quick, we need to push the mayor to do more around sanction detections. And the rates are very low. If you're from the black community, the figures that the mayor just quoted about a reduction in crime, you will not recognise. But 13 percent of London's population, the 48 percent of victims of homicide. We need the mayor to focus on how we can keep the, the black community in particular safe and Londoners in general safe. Yes, there's been a reduction in crime. Yes, the government have provided more money for police officers. But there's a particular community, a very big community, the black community, that is under real serious pressure. And I think the mayor could really push the police to do more around sanction detection rates. Thank you very much, um, Assembly Member. We are out of time on policing and safety now. I, re I regret that. Um, we're now going to move on to air quality in the and the environment. Um, and please keep an eye on the chat box and like the questions you would like to be answered. I'd like to first uh, welcome uh, the first questioner in this section, which is who is Simon Smith from the London Borough of Bexley. Simon. Good evening. Um, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, highlighted the urgency for global climate action and justice and the importance of green wild spaces. These spaces are not only important from an environmental perspective as carbon stores, the health benefits of immersing ourselves in green space are now widely accepted. Please can the Mayor and London Assembly explain their short and long-term plans to increase and improve London's green spaces, including urban rewilding projects and the introduction of natural corridors to link pockets of different wildlife habitats. Thank you. And the next question comes from Abbe Taylor Billington from Hounslow. Good evening, thank you. I've noticed a lot of cars idling when parked, black cabs leave their engines running in the ranks, and buses emit smoke and fumes despite being cleaner and greener. So following COP26 and in advance of phasing out petrol and diesel engines, what plans are in place to clean up the transport network and air quality? For example, could a no idling regulation be put in place across the capital 
or at least trialled as a global city pilot. Thank you. Mr Mayor, if you could respond to those questions. Yeah, I mean, before I go to the questions, I mean, I mentioned in my opening the, the, the number of resignations in Downing Street. When Sean Bailey spoke, I thought we'd have another resignation uh, this evening, but, but clearly, clearly not. He's got too much, uh, he's got no shame, clearly. He's still a member of this, uh, I beg his belief. Going to uh, Simon, your, your, your question uh, first of uh, all. I, was, I spent a lot of time in Glasgow uh, and the energy from uh, activists, uh, NGOs, young people, mayors outside the conference centre was very different from the lack of energy and dynamism inside uh, the uh, COP26 conference hall. And I think that's why we've got to, we've got to just take ownership and get on with it and not wait for the cavalry from national government to arrive to address the issue of uh, climate change. And you raise a really important point. And actually this, this really, if I'm honest, the penny drop for me in the issue you raised about nature rewilding and the environment during the pandemic. Because just think about how much those of us living in London cherished going for a walk at the common, going to the park, hearing birds sing and uh, so forth. And for me, it's an issue of social justice. The fact that there are too many Londoners without access to green spaces. One of the things I'm doing, Simon, a good example of us working on a cross-party basis is Ben Goldsmith, uh, who's uh, done lots of work in the, in, in the environment uh, uh, area. He's got a more famous brother uh, who, who's, who's been an opponent of mine in the past. He had a really good idea uh, in relation to how we can rewild our capital city. And so I'm working with Ben Goldsmith and many others uh, to rewild uh, our city, to bring back species that haven't been seen in the capital city for some time. Uh, and we're going to set up a group of experts uh, we've, we've put aside uh, more than £600,000 worth of money because you're spot on about the importance of rewilding our capital city. But also, at the same time, Simon, uh, we are making sure we protect the green spaces we have in the New London plan. We're not, we're not content with that. We're trying to make sure there's more green spaces, green walls, green roofs, uh, uh, pocket parks, uh, and so forth. And we're backing that up with, with money from uh, City Hall. Leonie Cooper, who's a member of the Assembly, uh, has been advocating both publicly and privately uh, on this uh, area. We've also so far, uh, Simon, I can't take personal credit for planting all of them, planted more than 350,000 trees. We're going to plant another 70,000 over the course of the next few uh, weeks. We're planting trees as well and increasing the tree canopy of our city. Why? Because that helps us deal with the issue of mitigation and adaptation in relation to the heat waves, in relation to flash flooding and uh, so forth. But it's a really important issue. By the way, a good example of the Greens, the Lib Dems, Labour working together. Uh, if you could help us persuade the Tories uh, to get on board the Assembly, I'd be really grateful. In relation to idling, a really, really, really good question in relation to the consequences of idling in both health terms, uh, but also greenhouse gas emissions. So I've got an ambition uh, to get to zero carbon by 2030. We're only going to get there by reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, from transport, the workplace and our homes. Uh, you know, as a consequence of what comes from our cars, you've got uh, 4,000 premature deaths a year because of air pollution, uh, children with stunted lungs forever, and also with a whole host of health issues from asthma, dementia, cancer, heart disease. So TFL are looking into what we can do with the bylaws and the laws we have to end idling. In the meantime, we've got some great campaigns with more than 350 schools around school streets, around uh, no idling officers. We've got some great councils. I see some here from Hackney. Hackney doing a great job uh, with their council officers, going to the communities, uh, persuading parents, those dropping off kids, those outside schools, not to have their engines uh, idling. A lot of it is education. Nitrogen dioxide, particular matter, and the carbon dioxide are, are bad for everyone. Uh, and the City of London and us have a campaign, engines off, every stop uh, campaign. So look, look that up. Any help you can give in relation to lobbying MPs for national legislation would be much appreciated. Thank you. Can I call on uh, Assembly Member Zach Polanski to ask uh, to answer that, those questions? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for your questions. I agree with what much of what the Mayor was saying there, and what I really like about these questions is they're drawing attention to our twin crises, the climate emergency and our air pollution crisis. 
But what the two questions suggest is these two things are massively linked. And we need to make sure that we're reducing our carbon emissions in the city, making uh, our active travel greener. So that's things like walking and cycling and better public transport, cleaning the air, and making sure we're dealing with the air pollution crisis. Now, as the chair of the Envir Environment Committee, I was delighted to go to COP26 and I was there with the mayor and could see lots of good action happening. However, as a Green Party London Assembly member, there were some frustrations because some of these things we have been campaigning on for years. And it's good to see that people like the mayor and other parties are finally coming to the table. But we do need action faster. So one good example I can give you to do with our roads is smart, privacy-friendly road charging. Now, this is something my colleagues Sean Berry and Caroline Russell have been campaigning on for a while on the Assembly, and credit to the mayor because he is now considering it. However, he's saying that he's going to look at it before 2030. We know we're in a crisis. If the uh, an alarm is ringing, you don't you know, wait ages for the ambulance. You have to get there quickly. So we've got to deal with these things. And we know from a report from Centre for London that we could start smart-friendly privacy road pricing now, and we need to get there much sooner. And finally, I would just say we need to move forward on these things, not backwards. The mayor has a plan to build the Silvertown Road Tunnel. This is a £2.5 billion new road building project from Greenwich to Newham. This is an awful idea. We know in Newham, for instance, that there's disproportionately people from ethnic minority backgrounds and low income backgrounds. So this is not just an air pollution issue. It's a social justice issue, too. The mayor needs to reconsider and cancel the Silvertown Tunnel. Can I now call on Assemblymember Cooper to respond? Uh, thanks uh, very much, Chair. And um, uh, you will have just heard the Mayor mention um, that some of us, including myself, have uh, you know pressed him on the issues relating to, particularly on biodiversity. Um, as Assembly members, we can produce our own reports, and I did one on biodiversity and new housing developments. And I was really pleased that the Mayor adopted some of the, uh, the ideas that came forward as recommendations around a London greening factor and net biodiversity gain into the London plan. But the London plan gets real strength if the boroughs also are very strong on it as well. So don't forget, if you're listening in tonight, to um, make sure that your local borough has a really good local plan that is in line with the best practice that's in the London plan. Now, um, it's really important also if you've got um, a Conservative MP who has the ability to take up these issues in Parliament, just as the Mayor was saying, you know, some of the legislation that's been going through on the Environment Bill is just not strong enough. And the Assembly actually passed a motion supporting the climate and ecological emergency um, bill because we are so concerned um, that we need to have stronger legislation. So you can join with us in, um, you know, I spent a lot of time at the examination in public of the London plan along with Assembly Member Russell. Um, we probably wanted to see it a bit stronger. We are continuing to chivy the mayor, but if you join in as well and give those strong messages about what we need to see in terms of biodiversity, because we know that trees help reduce the urban heat factor. They help reduce flood flooding. They uh, they take up carbon. They are you know the perfect um, way of addressing the climate emergency in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Make sure that you are pressing locally wherever you live in London for more trees, more shrubbery, um, less hard surfaces. It's so important for the future of our city to make it a place that we can all continue to live in into the future. So great first question. Um, thanks very much for that, Simon. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can we keep our responses nice and concise, please? We've got limited time. Assembly Member Bakari. Uh, thank you. Si uh, I, just to Simon's question about um, increasing wild, wildlife and, and, uh, and biodiversity, uh, we are supporting 10 urban parks. That's what the, the Liberal Democrats have been saying in our manifesto, and we will continue pushing for that. We are showing in our uh, Liberal Democrat-run councils or demonstrating uh, greening our roofs and our walls, like in Sutton. So there's lots of ways that we can work with the infrastructure of London to increase uh, making London greener. And in terms of the question that Abby said about idling, I've been working closely with Mums for Lungs. I'm a mum myself and I walk my kids to school every day. I know the impact that these cars are having on my children's health. And, I know, I, and I'm also working with Asthma UK and the, Lung, and the Lung Foundation as well. And I've been talking to these groups specifically about the health of our Londoners impacted by uh, things like idling. I have written to the Mayor recently about a 
a motion that we successfully passed on wood burning stoves as well. I'm yet to hear um, his response to that, but it was successfully passed. And it is a really important that we raise awareness about things that are impacting our air and polluting our air. And if we raise awareness about things like idling and wood burning stoves, and also making sure that people know that there are sometimes our city is impacted by high pollution alerts. There's been a recent event recently where people shouldn't have been driving because of the level of pollution in London. And that's th those are the times that we really need to be focusing on raising awareness that driving our cars, idling, wood burning stoves, and all of these things that are impacting our air is so, so damaging. So let's start raising awareness and let's push the mayor to do more in this area. Thank you. Assembly Member Best, if you could come in. No Assembly Member Bishop. She's just going to... Assembly Member Fortune, if you'd like um, to come in, please. Oh, you're there, are you? Sorry. Assembly Member Best. Thank you. Um, yeah, and good evening to everyone joining us from London this evening. Um, I think it's important to state we need to improve air quality in London, but that can't be done on the backs of the poorest in London and the disabled. And that's what the policy change, uh, policies that we're seeing today is making happen. Um, so, for example, we had an environmentally uh, meeting the other week. We had the amazing campaigner, Rosamond Kissy Deborah, join us. And, and she's been fantastic talking about air quality uh, for many, many years in London. And one of the really important points we drew upon is the LTNs that have been rolled out. And what you see with these LTNs is that they push traffic away from, you know, those uh, big terrace houses and suburban roads and onto the high streets and which have become more and more clogged where we know some of the most vulnerable uh, Londoners live who don't even drive themselves much of the time, but are now, you know, having even more of that pollution frost upon them. So we really need to try and intervene and work with councils to reverse some of those so damaging LTNs which are causing uh, mayhem for local residents. And it's, it's not just that, it's the ULEZ as well. We've seen the ULEZ rolled out targeting the most uh, poorest Londoners that can't afford to switch a vehicle or the smallest businesses and smallest charities that can't afford to uh, switch vehicles. But it does nothing to tackle the big boys in London that we know are using deliveries willy-nilly and not actually putting out any effort into reducing their emissions. So we need a complete shift here uh, to look to tackle the real issues and the real people causing pollution in London and not just target the, the uh, poorest Londoners because they're an easy target. And that's where we are at the moment. And that's the shift that needs to happen if we really want to hit 2030. Thank you. And Assembly Member Fortune. Thank you very much. Um, building on my colleague Emma's point about um, uh, air pollution and the measures that the, the mayor has put in place to tackle them. I mean, it, it, it's right that they need to be tackled, but you need to take a holistic approach to it. As Emma was saying there, that uh, because of these expansions, some of the poorest in our community have been hit. That includes uh, charities, that includes people who are just moving around to, uh, to visit friends and family or go to work. I mean, you need to tackle the problem, but you can't just, just cut the cancer out. You also have to stitch up the wound. And something that we've suggested to the mayor in terms of helping to stitch up that wound is supporting those Londoners to transition to cleaner vehicles. There were scrappage schemes that were in place um, up until towards the end of last year, but they've ceased to be funded now. We found some funding that could help to support that. We found over 50 million pounds in the business rate reserve fund that could go to help supporting Londoners to transition to those cleaner vehicles. You can't just tax and fine uh, the poorest Londoners uh, to try and resolve this, this problem. Coming back to what uh, Simon said as well, Simon from Bexley, as I said, I represent Bexley and Bremley. I, I couldn't agree with you more about you know, the wonderful green spaces that we have there. And we need to really commit to protecting those green spaces and protecting our green belt. Now, what I'm really proud about with Bexley and Bromley, two conservative run boroughs, is that we have the highest recycling rates in London. London, uh, compared to the rest of the country, has appalling recycling rates. Um, it's, it's one of the worst regions in the country. And I would really implore the mayor to tackle that and tackle some of the specific challenges around recycling to make sure that we have that whole approach to having a, a, cleaner, a, a cleaner, greener London, rather than just taxing those people that can't afford it. 
Yeah, Andrew, can I, can I respond to some of these points obviously I've been referred to by um, the, the previous two uh, speakers? Firstly, if uh, the last two speakers uh, as proud conservatives have any influence over the worst two boroughs, Barnet and Wandsworth, uh, we'd be really grateful in, reducing, in relation to reducing and uh, recycling. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, the, both uh, the previous two speakers claim to be friends of uh, poor people. If they can speak to their government in relation to the energy bills uh, going up hugely as a consequence of them being in the pockets of the likes of uh, Shell uh, by cutting VAT and by uh, charging a windfall levy, we'd appreciate it. But actually, the reason why we're so passionate, the Greens, the Lib Dems, Labour, and me as the Mayor, in relation to our policies around air quality and air pollution, is the poorest Londoners, least likely to own a car, who suffer the worst consequences of air pollution. Almost half Londoners don't own a car. Uh, six out of 10 of those in uh, the ultra-low emission zone don't own a car. And when the previous speaker, Emma Best, has the audacity to talk about Rosamond. She took Boris Johnson to court uh, because he failed to protect uh, the air quality around Ella's uh, uh, school. Some of the policies that we've been in favour of, the Lib Dems, Labour, uh, uh, Greens and myself, that the Conservatives, the previous two have spoken, have been against, are the T-charge, are the ultra-low emission zone, are the expansion of the ultra-low emission zone, of the fares freeze, of increasing cycling fivefold, of widening pavements, of our London plan, of some of our school streets. And so what I'd say to those watching is judge people by their actions. I'm afraid the last two people talk a good talk and they literally don't walk the walk. Can I, can I ask you to bring your comments to a conclusion? I'm afraid we've run out of time on this section. Um, the next section is... Uh, so the next section is about housing. Um, keep like, liking your favourite chat questions and adding your own. Uh, for the first questions uh, coming from uh, the public, I'd like to welcome Jasmine Ajada George, who's the chair of the London Youth Assembly. A wonderful body, may I say. Thank you. As you know, the London Youth Assembly works to represent the issues of most concerns of young people across London. One of the key issues that is raised with our members repeatedly is a concern about living conditions and the impact this has on the life chances. What are you doing to ensure young Londoners are living in a safe housing environment? As sadly, there's a lot of homes in London which have mould, leaks and insects, which is not a safe living environment. A recent case study from Fronzi from Croydon said there's a lot of mould growing because of the leaks and has been like this for a very long time, which is not right. It's an unsuitable condition. With the person going back and forward with the council, leading to not much being done, living long term in these conditions also leads to ill health on conditions such as asthma. This can have an impact effect on lockdown, um, having to do schoolwork in unsafe, damp conditions affecting their mental well-being. Um, this could also lead to a further effect in their education. So what are you doing to ensure people are not living like this? And how are you helping those who are currently living in these conditions? Thanks, Jasmine Jada. And uh, next question is from Alex Richardson from Haringey. Alex. Thank you. Um, I'm a young professional in a job that pays above the average salary for the UK and London. With the maximum mortgage, I'm only able to buy a one bedroom flat, saddling myself with around £250,000 to £300,000 of debt. Factoring interest rates, that almost doubles the amount I will repay in my lifetime. <laughs> Current average house prices in my borough are £750,000, which is 2.25 times the outer London average. There are schemes to try and help, which end up giving, making you worse off uh, with little that truly helps you out. As a mayor, how are you going to assist young people to be able to afford to buy property in London and get on the housing ladder, helping to reduce the impact of high interest rates adversely affecting Londoners and stop young people being taken advantage through the schemes like the equity loan that gives developers an extra 40% to charge higher prices on new homes within the cap of £600,000? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'd now like to ask the Mayor to respond, if you could. 
So, so th thanks for both those uh, excellent questions. Uh, Jasmine, look, uh, look I, I, I'm born and raised in a council estate. I, I've seen the difference having a, a, a good quality home uh, with a decent rent can make to a family's uh, life. Both affordable rent and a decent standard home, they go hand in hand as far as I'm uh, concerned. And we're particularly seeing uh, the poor standards you mentioned, the cockroaches in people's homes, the mould, the damp. In those homes, we have a, a landlord renting privately. Uh, it's a big issue that we've seen over the last uh, 30 years, the proliferation of the private landlord and the conditions being squalid. Uh, in the 1980s, the law was uh, made easier for landlords and there are few rights given to tenants that's allowed landlords to take advantage. So a number of things we've done since I've been mayor with limited powers, and we've now got a register of dodgy landlords uh, so tenants can see who a dodgy landlord is. And we supported councils bringing more prosecutions so more landlords can be named and shamed so people know not to use those uh, landlords. We've trained up our police to take enforcement action against landlords who, for example, have sheds in the garden where you've got people uh, sleeping. And at the same time, we've put pressure on councils and housing associations. Some of the councils and housing associations have uh, homes that aren't decent uh, standards. And so we continue to work with them to improve the standards uh, there. And we're also lobbying the government for an ombudsman to help those in social housing. That, are, that includes housing associations who've got very little rights when the conditions are awful. They're scared to go to the landlord, the council or the association because they know uh, there's a monopoly. And that's why this ombudsman would give real teeth to the tenants and uh, residents. We're going to carry lobbying the government for more uh, powers, at the same time highlighting some of the abuse uh, taking place. These landlords are making a massive, massive profit at the expense of tenants living in squalid uh, conditions. We're also, by the way, from City Hall now, providing legal advice to those people in squalid conditions and so close to people to decent lawyers. Because the government's taken away legal aid, uh, for many people bringing housing cases, many lawyers aren't able uh, to provide the advice uh, because there aren't the funds there to do so. So we're supporting law centres where we going to, to bring court challenges to hold to account these dodgy landlords, even if it is a council or a housing uh, association. Alex, your question is linked actually with the first one, which is a basic shortage of supply to meet the demand. And I'm afraid some of the government's policies, you mentioned one, help to buy scheme have led to inflation of homes to sell because the, the support given by the government is simply added on uh, by the seller to increase the price of uh, properties. We've got a massively increased supply of homes to have any impact on the uh, uh, cost in relation to demand. But also, Alex, we just have a diversity of housing being provided in London. I went to see a previous Chancellor, Philip Hammond, who agreed with me in relation to uh, uh, the market being broken in London. And to give him credit, he asked Oliver Letwin to do a report in the solution. And one of the solutions uh, Letwin had was a diversity of housing supply. More council homes, more homes uh, are generally affordable from partners, market value homes and other homes as well. And that diversity would help bring down uh, the cost of housing, um, uh, but also would lead to a situation where uh, those who are building homes for sale aren't hoarding them because they don't want to flood the market, which brings the price uh, uh, down. In the meantime, Alex, what we've done is we've thrown away a, a, the dodgy definition of what an affordable home was to make it more accessible to people like you who've got a decent salary, would never be eligible for a council home. We're increasing the number of council homes to record numbers, but also we have a new offer called the uh, London Living Wage Intermediate Housing, helping people like you, shared ownership to help people like you, but also we're working with responsible developers to have build to rent. Why is that important? Because it means people like you can have an affordable rent you're paying and they put money aside to save for a deposit because not all of us have bank of mum and dad to help us out with a deposit to buy a home. And I recognise many Londoners still have the aspiration to be homeowners. Here is some silver lining, which is we've got record numbers of affordable homes being begun in London, record numbers of council homes. The bad news is we have more and more uh, Russian oligarchs and those from around the world basically money laundering by buying property in London, leaving it empty, using them as gold bricks. The bad news is a combination of uh, construction inflation, uh, Brexit and so forth. There are real pressures in relation to the housing supply. So we continue to work with the government. There's now a very good Secretary of State, Michael Gove. We're working with Michael Gove 
about what we can do together to fulfill your aspiration uh, to be a homeowner in the capital city of our country. Thank you. Could I ask Assembly Member Sen Moema to reply? Thank you so much, Chair, and uh, thank you for your questions, Jasmine. And um, I just want to make sure that we are really thinking about the wider issues in the housing sector here in London, whether it's private renting, the lack of um, well-sized housing in the social rented sector, and those people that want to break into the market, like Alex, um, in the um, to own their own homes one day. Um, ultimately, the house, housing in London has become really difficult and unaffordable for many, many people. I want to just really push and continue to push for um, a private sector rent control, because ultimately a lot of the issues that we face in the capital are caused by people being made homeless when they have places to go to, by living in privately rented accommodation, which they um, it means that it's so expensive that they cannot save for their home and doesn't give them the security that they want to have should they want to set foot down roots and stay in a community and raise a family. And let alone those older Londoners who are really feeling the cost of living crunch many, much, much more than many others across the capital. So it would be really good to hear why, um, from the mayor's perspective, why a London private rent commission um, will really benefit the capital and um, the benefits of those rent controls to really just stabilize the market so we can come out of the post-COVID crisis and address one of the most major cost of living issues, which is the cost of housing here in London. Thank you. Assemblymember Hall, if you'd like to reply. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this, of course, Chairman, is your area and you know it only too well. You have been begging the mayor for years to make sure that we have homes built with far more uh, bedroom accommodation instead of these one and two bedroom flats. Because, of course, the clue is in building more properties. The mayor has received just under £9 billion from the government and has promised to build affordable houses. Where are they? They're certainly not there. He's made a promise to start building 10,000 homes on TfL land uh, by 2020. And he's only started building 40 percent, 14 percent of what he promised. And this is where the problem is. The Conservatives are desperately worried by those living in some really substandard accommodation. Um, as I say, the problem is the, the real expert on this is the chairman who can't speak but the real failure here is Sadiq Khan. He has been given billions of pounds to build proper family housing, and he has failed miserably. Thank you. And Assemblymember Sakina Sheikh. I was a very impassioned speaker to come in behind. Perhaps I can offer a kind of uh, balance to that view in terms of the affordable housing in London that's been built over many years um, under Sadiq's leadership. And actually, the problem is we've had one hand tied behind our back, as usual, like we did with TfL and now we do with the planning system. If national planning policy emboldens developers, then we have one hand tied behind our back when we're trying to build affordable housing. And despite that, despite that, the London plan under Sadiq Khan pushes for affordable housing, pushes developers in the right direction and fights to ensure that London is an affordable place, especially for young people. I can really relate to some of the questions that we've heard. And thank you so much for raising um, the difficult housing conditions that we have. And this renter reform bill that we've been promised by the government again and again with shifting goalposts yet to be showing us actually in any kind of material form what it looks like. I think I'd like to echo what uh, Assemblymember Moema said about uh, uh, rent caps, how that can be really progressive for this city and something that our Mayor Sadiq has been talking about for nearly two years now. So it'd be nice to see the government listen. And also we need to make sure that these senseless evictions stop happening. So banning Section 21, which is again supposed to be coming in the Renters Reform Bill, um, it would be nice to see the government actually put their money where their mouth is um, and bring that legislation to Parliament so we can start making sure that we build better housing for everyone. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move to the top liked questions from the chat. So I'm going to read all three out. Um, and I should emphasize these are not my questions, though some of them might sound familiar. Um, tall and th this is from Stuart Mayer in Bromley. Tall buildings are starting to blight our suburbs. Do you agree that high rise, high density developments on the outermost edge of the capital are inappropriate and should be discouraged? Would the mayor consider calling in such schemes? 
and also from Bromley is Steve Whirl. I live in Orbington. There is a planned application for two 20-storey buildings, which are bad for mental health issues and are dangerous, and the fire brigade agree. We have 1,700 people who object to the plans. How can you assist us? And finally, from Waltham Forest, we have Kate, who's asked, who's, um, asked the question, will our mayor consider that young families in London need housing provision as well, and that developer schemes must diversify creating houses too? Mr. Mayor. Thanks for all those uh, uh, questions. So look, with, with tall buildings, my view is set out in the London plan. Uh, and in summary, uh, tall buildings is all about uh, place, it's all about design, it's all about quality. Uh, I'm not in favour of a blanket ban of tall buildings across uh, our city, nor am I somebody who's in favour of uh, a sort of um, uh, situation where you've got tall buildings blocking out uh, the River Thames, uh, some sort of Grand Canyon. Uh, which we saw with the previous uh, mayor who allowed, those of us who know South London, Nine Elms and Vauxhall, the monstrosities that were allowed before I was uh, a mayor is the, the, the consequence of a laissez-faire approach towards uh, planning. In relation to uh, the, the Orbington examples, uh, the reason why I can't talk about uh, specific um, uh, uh, tall buildings is uh, there are some tall buildings uh, that I have called in um, uh, that I'm going to be considering soon in relation to planning uh, and the Orbanton ones may also be coming in and the way it works is I have a sort of a quasi-judicial role as the mayor and if I was to comment on, on any specifics uh, it could be said that I prejudged uh, the application that's why I can't comment on specifics um, but the second question reminds me of a, a general point which is we in London have more tall buildings than the rest of the city times two and some. So in relation to the concerns around safety that Grenfell exposed and the built environment, the London Fire Brigade are incredibly worried. We have more than 8,000 buildings above 18 metres. Between 11 metres and 18 metres, we have more than 90,000. Many of these buildings have dodgy, dangerous cladding and other pieces of work that needs remediation that the government's uh, not funded, uh, even though it's been almost five years since the Grenfell Tower fire. Some of this we're rectifying in relation to the new London plan. We have, in relation to new build, uh, the, the most safest planning policies of any city in the world. You've got to have an evacuation list. You've got to have plans approved by uh, the NFB and so forth and so forth. So I'm confident about new buildings. So without commenting on the specific uh, in relation to the buildings uh, in Orbington, if a building uh, was to be proposed where the NFB had any concerns, they'd probably fall foul of the London plan uh, and the council would be unwise to you know, put uh, for obvious uh, reasons. The last question is a really important point. Look, uh, the, what Alex was referring to in the previous question was the cost of a home in his borough of £700,000. The average cost of a home in London, a home to buy, is north of £500,000. So young families can't afford to buy a property that's commensurate with their needs in London. That's why we need to make sure we have uh, uh, affordable homes built for families. Uh, we've now required councils to, to do an assessment of how many affordable family homes they need in their borough. And that then determines which homes they give uh, permission to. And it's really important for us to build affordable family homes in London. There is no point building homes costing £700,000 for families because most young families can't afford them. I think you can afford them is Russian oligarchs using them as gold bricks in our city and using our city as the money laundering capital of the world. And I'm lobbying the government to close the loopholes and to have a register of those foreign owners who own properties in our capital city. I have nothing against foreigners. Some of my best friends and family are foreigners. What I don't want them to do is to use our capital city uh, as a money laundering uh, uh, exercise or to buy homes that are left empty. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, I regret we're um, out of time on, on, on this, and I know that other as Assembly members had uh, wanted to come in, so I do apologise for that. Um, I, we'll now move on to uh, London's economic recovery. Uh, our first question comes from uh, Chino Wills Cole from the London Borough of Southwark. Chino. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, Assembly members, and uh, good evening, everyone. My question to the mayor is, small nonprofit organizations, particularly those that serve Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, are struggling to cope in London as a result of the pandemic's effects. Is there any assistance from your office, Mr. Mayor, to help these small organizations doing incredible work in the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities? If so, how can they obtain this assistance? Thank you. Thank you. And the next question online is um, uh, from Jamal Afsal from Ealing. Jamal. Hi, good, e good evening, uh, Chair, uh, Mayor of London and the London Assembly. There's quite a lot of bright ideas in the UK, especially youngsters. They don't know how to go about uh, creating new businesses. So my question to the Mayor of London is, when will you create a 24-7 support study and financing hub station which is accessible for all ages especially the young into progressing their ideas in innovation new enterprises manufacturing technology food and science uh, just like silicon valley mit and san francisco institutions where international success has always been conspicuously ine inevitable so the success rate has always been very high in new businesses Thank you, Jamal. Um, Mr. Mayor, would you like to respond? Yeah, firstly, Chino, thanks for your question. It's a really important question. One of the things this pandemic has done is both expose and exacerbate the structural inequalities and racial inequalities that exist in our city. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's Black, Asian, minority, ethnic Latinos who have disproportionately suffered in terms of loss of life and also businesses closed down uh, as a consequence of this pandemic. So what we've done in City Hall is working with the chair of the 33 boroughs, 32 boroughs in City of London, set up a London Recovery Board. And we're working with faith communities, Black Asian, Morris ethnic groups, the NHS, the police, the fire service, the private sector, to give support to the voluntary and community sector who've been brilliant in this pandemic and who've been starved of funds. Some of these organisations can't fundraise because of the uh, pandemic. Many of them have lost out on uh, grants and so forth. So there's a number of things uh, we've been doing to target the resources we have, particularly uh, to Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. Uh, and so what I suggest, Chair, with your permission, is if one of your team could take Chino's details, I'll get my office to email Chino uh, 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 some of the details. Uh, we can amplify again on my Twitter tomorrow uh, some of the groups, uh, Andrew, to allow people like Chino and others to have access to the information that allows them to bid for some of this money because these groups may go under without this uh, uh, support. Uh, Jamal, in relation to your very good question, here's some really good news. Uh, we have a 24 hours a day, seven days a week support system for businesses across uh, London. Uh, when you get a chance, when we're finished uh, and you're not watching the news because there's been even more resignations from Downing Street, I'm told, but Sean Bailey still hasn't resigned. Um, there is a London business hub you can type into uh, Google, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that gives new businesses, new entrepreneurs, advice and assistance. I've set up, Jamal, um, uh, a bigger part of I didn't set it up. The previous mayor set it up, but it was a good idea, so I've run with it. The Mayor's International Business Programme. I don't take along anybody inappropriate, though, on these trips. Um, everyone who goes on these trips uh, goes on merit, uh, not because I'm sleeping with them. Uh, uh, and so the Mayor's International Business Programme I like the previous mayor, um, allows uh, businesses in London who want to go overseas, uh, want to meet angel investors, want to meet venture capitalists, want to do business in other parts of the world, to come on this international mayor's business program. Uh, it's not a merit uh, since I've been mayor. And so that'll help your business flourish and uh, thrive going uh, forward. We've also got loans uh, we've managed to secure. So many, many black businesses, female founders can't access capital from the traditional routes. So we've teamed up with angel investors, venture capitalists, and we have some money from the European Union, which we give to uh, uh, businesses, either a loan or a grant to help them uh, grow. And finally, we're working really closely with our universities in our city. We're blessed. We have more uh, top universities in our city than any other city in the uh, world. And so our universities are working really hard with us to make sure there's a pipeline of talent given the support from our uh, businesses. And finally, Jamal, I've announced uh, uh, this week, uh, I mentioned it in my opening uh, comments, 
a Skills for Londoners Roadmap. Uh, if the London Business Hub doesn't help you, go to the Skills for Londoners Roadmap, which gives you an idea of some of the opportunities available to you and your team in relation to uh, the skills that will help you flourish and thrive going forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to perhaps correct what you said in your previous in, in your previous statement that may be potentially libelous. Is there anything that you want to say? Uh, no, I think Sean Bailey should resign. I think his behaviour has been outrageous. He's let down the Assembly. He's let down a public office. I note that four members of the Downing Street team have resigned this evening, and I hope he'll do the decent thing and uh, resign himself. It, it was the decent thing that I was looking for. Uh, Assembly Member Ahmed, if you'd like to reply. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor, for, for that answer. And of course, one of the big issues that needs to be addressed uh, in terms of London's economic recovery is what is actually happening to the people of our city, the poorest people of our city, and the government-created cost of living crisis. At the moment, we are looking at, um, everyone knows about the energy bills that are going to go through the roof from April. Inflation now predicted to be at 7%. Fuel prices going up and the national insurance contributions that the government disgustingly refuses to postpone and the un universal credit uplift that was cut last year for the poorest of people that needed uh, needed that help. We've had, and um, you know, and I know that the mayor um, has spoken about this in the last couple of days, about the whole levelling up um, agenda. We know that levelling up at the moment means levelling down for the poorest of communities in London and across the country. What is really disgusting about the levelling up agenda from government is that it has become a fight between North and South, and it should never, ever be that. It is about making sure that people are able to survive and have the basics and actually be able to to cope with life as it is. It is not on, and I'm sure the mayor agrees with me, that the money that's been set aside uh, equates to 16p per head for a person in Hackney and £148 per head for, somewhere in, for someone in a rich area like Bromsgrove. Today we heard about the education levelling up, where there are 55 education areas that will be receiving specialist help, not one of them is in London. And I'm sure the mayor absolutely agrees with me that this is utterly disgraceful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I, uh, there are four Assembly members who want to come in on this. Can I just remind you, we've only got about nine to ten minutes left. So if you could allow some time for us to get to the questions that were on the chat. Uh, Assembly member Polanski, could you come in? Thank you, Chair. I agree. I think this underlines both questions. We have the cost of living soaring while incomes aren't soaring and they're coming down. We are in recovery and what we need right now at every level of government is a push for a universal basic income. This would lift people out of poverty. <clears throat> it would rebalance our society so parents didn't have to work three jobs just to make ends meet. And it would give people freedom to do what they want to do, which might be to set up a business or it might be to have more free time. Now, I've had different reactions to this on the Assembly. Kudos to the mayor who gave me warm words. He said that he would be happy for a pilot to happen in London and we need to have that conversation. But I was very confused last month when the uh, leader of London Labour said to me, no, no. And then all the Labour Assembly members voted against this. This is not time for party politics. We need to get together. The mayor's own research shows a universal basic income could lift 130,000 Londoners out of poverty. So let's get on with it. And now, uh, Assembly Member Umesh Desai. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to comment uh, on the government's uh, levelling up agenda, which is uh, yet another attack on London and Londoners. Uh, the government claimed that their levelling up agenda will bring prosperity to forgotten parts of the UK. They seem to have forgotten that many of these are, 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 are in London. Some of the constituencies I represent, in my constituency, some of the boroughs I represent, Barking and Dagenham, Tower Hamlets and Newham, have got levels of poverty deprivation, uh, deprivation on a par with many areas uh, in the north. Downgrading the capital's economic recovery runs against any levelling of agenda. 
This strategy will leave Londoners out in the cold and do little to address the real poverty that exists in our community. And just to give an example, Chair, about what I see as discrimination against London, the government's anti-London agenda, Barking Dagnum, that I represent, gets four pounds per head under the government's levelling up agenda. And as Assembly Member Ahmed has already commented, Bromsgrove, Bromsgrove in the West Midlands, gets 158 pounds per head. Barking and Dagnum, four pounds per head. Bromsgrove in the West Midlands, uh, 158 pounds per head. A clear example of the government's bias against uh, against London, Londoners, the anti-London agenda that we are now seeing also in the forms of attacks on the TfL. Thank you, Assembly Member Best. Please come in. Thank you. Um, the mayor's talked a lot about resigning this evening, and actually, when I go out and I speak to people in London, uh, more than any other late politician I've ever heard, people want him to resign. People <laughs> think he's done a rubbish job in crime. <laughs> London's transport isn't moving, and they want to know what he's going to do about it. And he comes on meetings and dismisses it, and dismisses those, pe those people by laughing at, about the comments that we are seeing. And most people, well, I know Labour politicians see it as well because I'm close to them, and they tell me. So the issue is this mayor isn't taking it seriously and it may be very convenient to push it onto government but it's less convenient when you find out that London actually has the highest spending per head in the entire country when London's transport system actually gets over double what the north of England gets. So it's very convenient to blame it all on the government but if it is all government what's the point of the mayor because the mayor's here to stop and so let's give one good example right we're talking about how we support those businesses and how we support uh, Londoners. And so you've got the Mayor's uh, London, uh, London Business Hub, which is only supported out of 1.1 million businesses in our city. It's only supported 8,000 businesses. That's about 0.7% of the businesses in this city that this mayor has helped. But yet again, he'll point fingers at the government and not take a single bit of that blame, not take a single bit of humility in saying, yes, I can do better. Thank you, Assembly Member Fortune. Yeah, again, following up on that point, it's all about responsibility, isn't it? Small business is the lifeblood of our city. Um, the, the questioners came on here asking some really interesting points about what can they do to get that support, especially post-COVID. And what we saw, unfortunately, were, were, were cheap political digs and, and point scoring. It's almost as if the mayor is more interested in getting his leadership bid for the Labour Party ready than being a responsible mayor of London. Now, if you look at something that's going to impact uh, outer London, it's the mayor's proposed boundary charge, which is charging people to drive in and out of our city. I've already had constituents come to me and say that they're really worried about how they can get goods in and out um, of their businesses how people can travel in to do work. And it's not just small businesses. This is going to impact uh, teachers and police officers and people that really support our economy. It's a shame the mayor takes the approach. He does try to score political points. My, my feeling is that if he were really serious about small business, he would have been serious about small business. Uh, Andrew, can I respond to... to, to well, the, can, you, can you respond at the end, please? Because we've got a number well, of questions that I'd want to get in from the chat first. Uh, well, well, yes, I think it's important to respond to the last two points, don't you think? Well, you can do that at the end. You can do that at the end. Um, no, don't be scared, Andrew. I'm not scared. I just want to make sure that Londoners' voices are heard. That's what Please our don't job resign, is. Please don't resign, though, you as well. Everyone resign. From Londoners that I don't want to He's lose. still going. Like what, Browning what Street. Opportunities uh, are the Mayor's office. Off, uh, this is from uh, Sonny Elton in my old borough of Hackney. What opportunities are the Mayor's office offering to the working class youth to escape our standard of living? We've got a question... Uh, from John Walters in Islington. Have the London Assembly taken into consideration the income that will be lost on road charges like the congestion charge and the low emission charge because people will not want to come to London? And the last question is from uh, Deborah Avellino from Brent. Uh, Dear Mr Khan, shouldn't we focus on training apprenticeships and new jobs creation towards transition to net zero new jobs? Under 25s and over 35s are having difficulty earning more than 15k in London whilst polluting jobs are still praised. And I'll go back to you now, Mr Mayor, if you can pick up what you wanted to earlier and then answer those three questions as well. But, uh, let, let me do the three questions from the Londoners first, because they're far more important than the, the last two Tory speeches. But I will deal with the last two Tory speeches in a moment. So in relation to your question, your first question about young people. So we have set up now. Uh, a Skills for Londoners roadmap, because I'm particularly concerned 
about young Londoners. Uh, we've only got uh, uh, the, the support from the government to help those above the age of 19. So we've set up free courses for those age 19 who are either not working or are receive a, a low income, who have no formal educations. And we're particularly targeting those communities in London uh, where there are high levels of unemployment and underemployment. Uh, and we're particularly targeted on future-proof jobs. Think about those jobs in health and social care, those jobs in the green economy, those jobs in hospitality, uh, those jobs in digital, those jobs in culture and creative industries. And so we've put aside a, a, a ring-fenced money of, of £44 million pounds just to help uh, in those sectors because we think they're future-proof uh, sectors. And if you use public transport, you'll see uh, some examples of Londoners who benefited from these uh, skills uh, that we're providing from City Hall. And please take advantage of some of these uh, uh, courses going forward. The second question was in relation to uh, the cost of uh, the congestion charge and ultra low emissions. Oh, look, we've got a choice to make as a city and a country. The cost of inaction to our economy, to livelihoods, to the environment and to the health, and the cost of action of taking uh, uh, the right bold action to address the issue of cutting congestion tackling climate change and uh, improving the air quality in our city. Think about how much money people, people pay in their bills because of lack of insulation. How much money people pay because of congestion, being stuck in traffic because of uh, gridlock on our uh, roads and so forth. By insulating our homes, by having double glazing, uh, by supporting people to walk and cycle, having the electric vehicle uh, infrastructure uh, with the renewable energy, we're reducing bills. But also it goes to the third question in relation to apprenticeships we're helping create jobs for young Londoners, which are future-proof jobs. And there is an advantage being a first mover getting to zero carbon. Who's gonna make these heat pumps? Who's gonna have the expertise for the district heating networks? Renewables, we can be world leaders and uh, so forth. So those that are against our plans to uh, you know, get to net zero, against our plans to cut congestion, against our plans to reduce air pollution is a more expensive route than the costs are of action. And in relation to the comments made by my good friends from the uh, Conservative uh, Party, I tell you what helps, what helps more business. Giving the contracts for PPE to small businesses rather than to your mates you go drinking with in a pub like this government has done and like Tory donors. And I'll tell you this, what helps more businesses is those that smell that those that sell big suitcases because the size of the suitcase required for the booze to be bought for the leaving dues tonight in Downing Street, well, that's a good business to be invested in. So nothing to do with you again then. Thank no you. Thank you, Mr me. Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think we're now out of time on uh, economic recovery. Uh, I regret that. Um, there's some pretty good questions uh, that were submitted that we were unable to get to. So for the last section of the meeting, we can take your questions on topics we haven't covered so far. We don't have much left, uh, time left to register your light questions quickly, but these could cover culture, sport, or volunteering, for example. Um, our first uh, contribute question comes from uh, Carmila Legarda from the London Borough of Barnet. Carmila. Thank you, uh, good evening. The rise of gangs and street violence has grown incrementally since the closure of youth centers, which were safe spaces for our youth and kept them off the streets and out of gangs. What have you put in place, apart from what you mentioned earlier, to address the lack of continued, continued lack of recreational and social facilities for young people of London? Thank you, Camila. Uh, the next question is from Sean Taylor uh, from the City of London. I can't quite see that question. Uh, uh, good evening, Sean Chair. Taylor. Uh, there yeah, you go. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Mayor, London Assembly, and fellow uh, questioners. Mayor, post the pandemic, how are you considering to make London attractive for workers to return, considering, as we've heard this evening, price and pri pricing? has risen in all areas, especially transport, and local economies still remain shut, reducing choice of venue for things as simple as lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, Mr Mayor, perhaps you could come in on that. Yeah, cracking questions. So, so, so come in, we've got, we've got a big issue. When, it, when I mentioned earlier on teenage homicides, a large proportion of teenage homicides, the victims and perpetrators 
are members of gangs. Uh, and often a gang can be a lawful thing, young people hanging around. But sometimes gangs turn into criminal gangs, people get involved in criminality, you've heard of county lines, a lot of it is registered to organised drug dealing. And so you've got to try and at an early stage distract people from getting involved in destructive things, idle hands, you know the same. And so what we're doing is a number of things. I've already mentioned the Young Londoners Fund, 100,000 young people giving constructive things to do in education, uh, uh, culture, uh, sports, uh, uh, dance and so forth. I've already mentioned the Violence Reduction Unit, 86,000 young people working with 126 youth clubs across uh, our city. Additionally, Camilla, we're, we're trying to uh, ensure that young people, particularly those not from middle class family, those who uh, you know may be struggling and have a mentor. I benefited from, from mentors uh, throughout my young age, you know, boxing coach, cricket coaches, my teachers, big brothers. Uh, many young ones haven't got that. So over the course of just the next year, we want at least 100,000 mentors to be a big one, 100,000 young people benefiting from uh, mentors. We also come in and we're worried this summer uh, about as lockdown was eased and restrictions lifted, a big increase in youth violence. But again, not rocket science, by giving young people constructive things to do over summer, lo and behold, youth violence went down by 42%, including gang violence as well. So from City Hall, we're going to carry on investing and supporting uh, young people. I want to thank, by the way, colleagues from the Lib Dems and Greens who support the Labour Party in relation to budget allocations for these uh, things. Good example of working together <laughs> with the causes of crime, as well as being tough on crime as well. And the final thing coming up before I move on to Sean's question is we've got to give young people hope, ambition, aspiration. We can't demonise and write off an entire generation because a small minority are doing uh, bad things. It's really important to talk up success stories when people do uh, well. That's what I referred to in, in my opening about the London Promise. You work hard, you get a helping hand, you can achieve uh, anything. Let's talk up the success stories uh, so more young people have aspiration and hope going uh, forward. And that's what the Skills for Londoners roadmap that we announced this week is all uh, about. Sean, the evidence actually is in outer London um, uh, and parts of outer inner London, uh, things are pretty good. There's been a good recovery. And that's during the pandemic, as people were working from home, those local economies have done well. The real crisis in our city is what's called the central activity zone. The centre of our city, I know you're from the City of London, City of London, Westminster, the Camdens, the Kenton and Chelsea, that sort of central of our city, the South Bank's uh, Canary Wharfs. And the first thing we've got to do is get international tourists back, right? And so we've got a big campaign, Let's Do London. Uh, which has encouraged uh, many tourists from around the country to come back. And now we're working on our campaign for North America. The three target audiences, uh, Sean, that will really help the centre of our city is uh, North America, USA and Canada, France and Germany. And so I've agreed with uh, a COVID business forum, which um, I chair, which are members of the, the, the business community in London, a, a strategy to get try to get these international tourists back. And the second big group, Sean, is getting people back to the office. Uh, we know we're now we've got our plan B restrictions. We've got to make the experience of public transport a good one. And that's why what, what Sean and Caroline said, and also my Labour colleagues in relation to you can't cut public transport and expect that capital city to help the national recovery. Right. People aren't going to want to, want to use a tube. if There are a few tube trains. They're not going to, want to use a bus want to use a bus if there are fewer buses and less frequent services and so forth. So that's why, you know, I know the Tories don't like me criticising the government. They don't like me lobbying for more resources for the government. I'm not going to apologise for being the champion and advocate for uh, our city to get more resources for our capital city. By the way, the most dangerous thing to uh, the future of our capital city is uh, levelling down, equating to making our country more equal by making London poorer. The way to make our country more equal is to give all cities and regions more powers and resources to be in charge of our own destiny. And sure, if we have some support from the government, so far I haven't had a pence from the government in relation to the international tourist programme, we could work together because we're on the same side to get international tourists back into our great capital city, which will be supporting the coffee shops, the restaurants, hospitality, and so forth, that you and I are both so passionate about. Thank you, Assembly Member McCartney. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I just want to address Camilla's point and just build on something that the mayor has said because we do know that um, as the mayor has said that youth services have been cut over the last decade and the leveling up white paper that came out yesterday 
again, made it very clear that London will not be able to bid, for the most part, for any funding for youth services there. So it's like a double whammy to our young people. And I think, you know, that the Young Londoners Fund that the mayor has invested in, and now his new deal for young people, you know, £70 million invested in activities. And that are after school, during holidays and regular and, and, and activities and particularly giving young people the confidence and skills to go further and to realise their potential. That's been a real lifeline for many of our community um, groups. So I'm really pleased that the mayor has invested in that. But the, the, there's one thing I, I also want to say, and that is about the importance of keeping our young people in school and learning. And so I've been really pleased that the mayor has invested time and money into um, supporting schools to be more inclusive. So the Violence Reduction Unit has been um, dealing with um, that. And also with the, when children are excluded from schools, um, the Violence Reduction Unit has given them one-to-one -one mentoring support. And that is so um, important. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to say there's a lot more to do and if government stepped up, we could really work in partnership to make that so much better for our young people. They deserve so much better than they're getting from this government at the moment. Thank you. Assemblymember Anne Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to, to Camilla, I really hear you. I'm, I, I'm a Barnet mum myself. Um, and I've seen my children grow up with Sure Start cut. So as my eldest was able to benefit, I actually worked for Sure Start, and my eldest was able to benefit from Sure Start programs. By the time my, my younger child was that age, that was already being cut back, programs were already being cut, and, and schools have been cut right the way through their education. So we have had um, the devastating impact of, of austerity with these young people growing up in London, and it's, it's, it's just not good enough for them. And I, I, do, I do share your concern. I have enjoyed seeing the impact that the Young Londoners Fund has had in Barnet. In my own council ward of Childs Hill, I've seen the direct impact of TFL funding for cycling programs, training for young people. They love their cycle uh, program so much that an offshoot of that has been the young people starting their own football club. And so I think these programs are so effective and, and they're so highly targeted, but I think there's a, there's a broader picture here and where I think Barnet Council could really, really help is when they have big regeneration programs such as the Brent Cross Regeneration, they need to include a youth strategy. And I think not having a concrete youth strategy and having social inclusion at the heart of these major regenerations in Barnet continues to be something that lets the borough down. So Camilla, I feel for you. I think where I see hope, I see our Mayor Sadiq Khan, I see the elections in May, and I see a Labour Party ready to lead on Barnet Council. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Dr. Onka Sahota. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the last speaker asked questions about how do we improve um, the quality of life and, and what we're doing more than uh, to help people deal with gangs. Look, the, the important thing is that we need to give a, give a good start to our children who are born in London. That's when the issues start. The first thousand days of a child's life are going to set the, um, the framework for the rest of the life. So we should be addressing housing, we should be addressing poverty, equality in childhood, short sure start, and giving them a good start um, in life. And I think that with the mayor Sadiq Khan, he's operating in all those all this levels. It's a multifactorial thing that you need to address all those issues rather than just individually. We're giving good air, air quality, we're improving more, more housing, we're, we're making sure that we are reducing inequalities in London and it's fighting for levelling up of London. So I think we are doing all those things, but of course it's, we need a government which cooperates with the democratic elected mayor of London rather than being a hindrance to, to the mayor. And I think that it's very rich of people saying that uh, the mayor can do more, but the mayor has to work with the government, the government has to recognise that the mayor of London has the mandate from people of London and they should be helping him rather than obstructing him in, in making sure London is levelled up rather than London being levelled down to the lowest levels of, of the country. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask Assemblymember Berry to come in. Yes, just very briefly um, on Camilla's question, because I know the mayor earlier on couldn't remember the number of youth centres that had closed across London. And that's the research that I started looking back 10 years um, to when we, we were shocked by riots in 2011. And that should have meant 
massive investment in youth services. But instead, we saw 10 years of austerity, and that's resulted in over 130 youth centres closing, over 600 youth workers losing their jobs, and over £240 million in total being pulled out of investment in young people. Now, the Young Londoners Fund is around about £80 million that's gone in over the past few years, but that is coming to an end. And although the mayor, I think Mayor and Joanne needs credit for this as well, um, have been quite creative in how they've used the adult education budget to put in mentoring and support for people who are over 18, there's still a big gap in youth services for under 18s. And they should be funded by councils and councils should be getting support from the government to do this as a statutory duty. There's still this big gap. We've done this little bit with the Young Londoners Fund to fill the gap that's been left by 10 years of austerity. But it's not not there yet and it isn't completely solved even with the efforts that we're making within city hall thank you and assembly member hall thank you chairman well i think we should have a little taste of reality here don't you the mayor has got nearly 20 billion pounds in his budget 20 billion pounds plus nine billion pounds i spoke of before regarding housing Billions of pounds of money for London for transport. And yet he sits there and criticises the government, says he hasn't got anything. He almost goes to them with a little bag saying, give me more, please. Absolute nonsense. He has got the money to put into various schemes like this. But no, politically, he'd rather just have a go at the Conservatives, have a go at the government. As for getting back to work, Mr Mayor, we are camping in Union Street because of your ridiculous scheme of putting us in the crystal. Where are all the people that work for the fire brigade, which is under your control? Where are they? Because they're not at work. Perhaps if they came into work, then more of the cafes would be serviced in the area, the transport systems, etc. The shops would be looked at. They are people in your control. They're not there. And we know this for a fact because we were rattling around in the building today with nobody else there. As for gangs, well, Cam Carmilla, I feel for you and I absolutely understand where you're coming from. Unfortunately, co confidence in the police is at a record low. We mustn't forget that the mayor is responsible. He's a police and crime commissioner. Yes, he'll throw everything at Cressida Dick or anybody else because, of course, nothing is ever the mayor's fault. It's Cressida Dick's fault. It's the commissioner of the, uh, the fire brigade's fault. It's always the government's fault. And you'll have listened in tonight. He'll say nice things to the Liberal Democrats and the Greens and he'll have a go at the Conservatives. And, of course, boringly, the government has always... I say to you, Mr. Mayor, you've got an incredibly large budget. You have got the best political job, in my view, in the country. Stop whinging and whining. Try and pretend that you like being mayor because you give no evidence of that whatsoever. Put your hands in your pocket and put things right because, my God, most people on this call, and I talk for all Assembly members, would be so proud to have your job. We would roll up our sleeves. We would get things done. If you put the amount of energy into getting things done as opposed to criticising the government and your conservatives on the assembly, then perhaps things would be better for Londoners. Instead of that, all we hear is you moaning. Stop thank, it thank and get on with some work. Uh, Chair, let, thank me you, those, member. Chair let, me, think, let me deal with those points. Uh, uh, no, no, you can come back after this question because Chair, we want Chair, to... we know she's a friend, but come on, let me... We want to hear the questions. Um, uh, question from John Waters in Islington. Are you going to reinstate St Patrick's Day and St George's Day in Trafalgar Square this year? Let me deal with the question. Uh, the short answer is, hopefully, uh, the promise I made before I became mayor was for London to have the best St. Patrick's Day celebrations we'd ever seen, promise made and promise delivered in 2017, 2018, 2019. Fingers crossed we can have uh, St. Patrick's Day and St. George's Day uh, back and indeed the marathon uh, as well. But let me deal with uh, three of the points raised by the previous speaker, Andrew. I know it's embarrassing uh, to you as uh, Susan Hall's friend. But let me deal with three of the points uh, she makes. The first point, I think Susan Hall is right, and I've got to accept many in the Assembly would love to be the mayor, and many have tried. Sean Bailey uh, tried. Andrew Boff uh, tried. And I'm sure others did uh, as well. 
but weren't successful. And thank goodness for that. The second point uh, that uh, Susan Hall made was in relation to my responsibilities as mayor, getting people back to the office. I'll tell you this, I often go to Whitehall to meet government ministers. There are very few civil servants who've returned to government, far more in proportionate terms, City Hall staff returned to civil servants. And that's before the resignations today, by the way. And Ms. the third Ms. point is by, gonna, listen, gonna, I know it's embarrassing. Andrew, I know it's embarrassing. I'm going to have to quiet you now. We've reached, we've reached the end of the session. If people want to see this conversation continue, as I'm sure the mayor wants to do, uh, Saved can, by Andrew yes, Boff, Susan, I love it. The mayor's question time on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, that, so that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you very much to everyone who's participated. Don't forget to keep an eye on our website for details of the next People's Question Time. And you can also keep up to date with the work of the London Assembly on any of our social media outlets. We would love to hear what you thought of tonight's events. On your screen, you will, see, uh, you will see a link and a QR code to our feedback survey, which will explain how to submit questions that we did not have time to answer tonight. Pre-registered audience members was, will also be emailed the link. Good night, and thank you once again for joining us, The Voice of London. Thank you.